Hello and welcome to our last module for critical thinking. This is module 13, using language thoughtfully. Um, that's not to say that we have not been thinking about this all the way through the course. Here we're just going to provide a final overview of some of the ideas that we've been discussing over the last uh, three and a half months uh, and kind of bringing it all together in terms of uh, revising, thinking, editing, thinking through, writing through, in order to make our ideas as clear and as concise as we possibly can. Okay, so when we communicate with one another, we're using words, uh, we could use images as well, but whenever we use language, uh, sounds and images, right, we're sending a message from ourselves, the sender, over to what's called a receiver. And that person can be listening to us, they can be watching us, for example, if we happen to be a mime, uh, or they're reading our work. But what we're doing is we're sending to another person, a receiver, ideas and information that we wish for them to understand clearly. And really also too, we're presenting to the other person how we think, because the choice of words, the choice of images, or the choice of gestures will say a lot about who we are and the way we think. So when we use language, it's as much about what we're saying as the person that is saying it. So language itself is the way in which we think about things. Now, what does that mean? That means that we don't have a direct uh, relationship to reality. We don't have a direct relationship to each other's minds uh, because we can't peer into each other's heads and see kind of what's cooking, right? What's going on there? The only way that we can communicate with one another is through language. Now, whether you want to call it a prison house or a gift, either way, language is the only means by which we have to communicate with one another. If that's the case, then careless language means sometimes a careless person, right? A person who does, doesn't care. Now, two ways or two things here. Doesn't care about the, the way they think. They just say the first thing that pops in their head. And two, it's a reflection on what they think of you. If they're going to be vague and imprecise and, and bordering on reckless in their use of language, that says that not only do they not care about how they come across, they also don't care what your feelings are. And so, if that's the case, when we read someone's work that is sloppy and careless, it's, it should at least, but it is a kind of a front to the, to the reader or the listener that that person doesn't even care enough to, to think about what they're saying. Uh, whether or not we have that filter inside our heads that stops us from sort of blurting out the first thing that pops in our heads, uh, we should have one. And if not, we should learn to, to cultivate one. What's important here is, sloppy language indicates a sloppy person and a sloppy person that really doesn't take into consideration how their message is going to be understood uh, or acted upon. Now the reverse is also true. If a person is clear and concise in their thinking, their speaking, their writing, chances are it's because they care about you. They care about how the message is going to be transmitted to them. So that's really kind of the long and the short of it. When you are listening to someone that chooses their words carefully, not hauntingly or, or haltingly, sorry, not hauntingly, haltingly, um, that doesn't mean that they're, they're unsure. No, actually quite the opposite. They're thinking carefully about that which they wish to, to say to you so that you will understand what they mean. So what does that also mean? It means that we're aware of the audience, the potential audience that will be listening to us and reading our work. And this should kind of sound familiar because we've talked about this a number of times and really what it refers to is Aristotle's three modes of rhetoric, right? Ethos, pathos, and logos. And here, when we're thinking about a person that carefully considers their choice of words, their sentence structure, the way in which their argument flows logically and consistently, not only are they a good, are they a good writer, but they're also someone that cares about the audience. They wish for their audience to listen attentively, but not have to struggle through every single word or sentence or phrase, trying to decipher what they're saying. So what they are showing, the, the writer or speaker, is ethos, right? Character. It says something about who they are. So what we are doing when we are using or relying on things like ethos is we are aware of our audience. We wish to communicate to our audience in the best way possible, using the best choice of words, the best phrase, 
to get her point across. And really, that could be in, in literally any situation. So again, by, uh, by way of recap, and by now, you should be able to identify them fairly clearly. Those three modes of persuasion that uh, Aristotle talks about in his book, Rhetoric, uh, written 2,500 years ago. And you know what? It's still good. Guess what? There hasn't been a revised edition. Surprise. So the three, ethos, ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos, speaker's credibility, right? The, the audience values. So someone who speaks from that position thinks clearly and carefully about language, how language impacts thought, both their own and the listeners. But the speaker's credibility really is, is upfront. Right? That person is thought through that which they want to say. Now, pathos, I'm not saying that it is uh, manipulative. Uh, it can be a good way to open uh, a, you know, an idea, a presentation, and also a really good way to conclude it. But you don't want to have literally every other statement be uh, some kind of emotional manipulation to browbeat the person into agreeing with you. You wish for your audience to come to their own conclusions. Now, clearly, you want those conclusions to be the ones that match up with what you're trying to present to them. But if you are only and exclusively using pathos, it sounds manipulative after a while because you're you're appealing to their emotions. And again, that's not to say that it is bad in and of itself, but it needs to be done selectively. Uh, it's like a kind of flavor, right? It kind of really spices up the conversation or spices up you know, the TED talk, whatever you want to call it. It's not a bad thing to use. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not a bad thing to use, but don't overdo it. And then finally, the very things that are spoken about and are listened to or, or read should at least exhibit some degree of logos, some degree of arrangement, right? The, the argument has to be arranged in a certain way. It has to move in a certain way. There should be evidence along the way that is, could be scientific or otherwise, but it is factual, verifiable, and can be tested. That's your evidence. And finally, the whole thing is glued together with a sense of logic that something inexorably moves from A to B to C. And if you can do that, that is very persuasive writing. So really, what are we talking about? We're talking about using language thoughtfully, critically, being aware of the audience. You're writing ethically, uh, ethically as well, because you are now aware of the responsibility that you have to the reader or the, to the listener on the subject matter. So if you are the expert, you do have to a certain degree a responsibility to the, to the reader to present these ideas clearly and concisely. So how do you do that? It's actually really simple. Right? You just write clearly. You try to choose the most appropriate language. Um, you know, you want to construct your argument in a very logical sort of way. Um, but ultimately, it still has to do with the notion of responsibility to the audience. Yesterday, for example, and I won't get into a lot of detail, I had to write a, an email to a student who had asked me about their presentation. Uh, and the presentation was a very good one, but that student was kind of hesitant, uh, did not display a degree of confidence in their work. It was a rough draft and it was intended to be a rough draft. And I was going to write an email and just say, well, you need to boost, boost your confidence, right? You need to show that. And then I stopped and I read it again and I showed it to another person. And I said, well, if this person may be a little bit anxious, uh, the word confidence might actually send them into a kind of tailspin. Right? They're going to lose confidence because I've called attention to it. So what did I do? And I'm going to do it right now. Hold on. Okay, here's what I did. I pulled out this book right here, Roger's Thesaurus. I don't know if you've ever seen one before. Uh, I have that in my dictionary right next to me every time I work and I write. Why? Because I always want to make sure that the words that I use are the right ones. So when I came to the word confidence, the first thing that came up as what's called uh, a synonym, a word like the other word, the first one was belief. So I thought, okay, let's change the focus. Let's change the intention still there, but let's change the focus away from confidence, confidence building to belief. And I rewrote the email and I said, uh, you have every right to believe in yourself 
because you are the expert in this field, you're, in this essay you're writing. So you come from a position of authority. And if you believe in yourself, you present to the potential listener, because this was a student presentation, you're presenting to the listener, not confusion and hesitancy and uncertainty, but thorough thinking through of something. You're at a, a point now, and it's not an impasse, it's, it's different roads to take. So you present all three, not in a confusing kind of way, but logistically, here's where we're at. All right, I've now studied this, this, uh, this idea this issue I have that I'm trying to work through. And I have these three different avenues I can follow through. I'm going to present all three of them to you. And you do that with a degree of confidence, yes. But you do it with a degree of believing in yourself, that you are aware that each one of these different avenues has its own, you know, its own dividends, its own payoffs. But at this point, you will then choose which one you wish to pursue. Uh, and so I rewrote the, the, the email uh, using and thinking about belief rather than confidence. And it went over much better. So here I didn't want to insult uh, the student. I didn't wish to browbeat them. I didn't wish to send them into an emotional tailspin either. But by simply choosing a different word and taking the, the uh, emphasis away from confidence building, to believing in oneself because you are the expert. You're the one doing the work. It was a simple change of a word, but the impact of the email was much different. Uh, I'm not making this up. I actually did, uh, the, did this yesterday because I read it and I knew something wasn't right. I knew something could potentially be misunderstood. And that's what happens when we write. We have the best of intentions, but we pick the, the wrong word and all of a sudden, the wrong thing happens. And so now we're having to scramble and email one another for a clarification. We don't want to do that. If we are responsible to our reader to begin with, we will less likely have this happen. If we choose that appropriate word, that appropriate language, the end result is going to be a much stronger statement that you're presenting to the other person that they will respond to positively. They will think about it. And the first statement back from a follow-up email was, Thank you for the feedback. I will, I will consider this. Uh, and then off, off they went to kind of clarify what, what it was that I had intended all along. And it was that student who used the word confidence. Uh, so it's, it was a simple choice of words, but it was very effective. So we're responsible to our readers or listeners or audience. We're also responsible to our subject matter because we wish to present it in an honest way. We don't want to sort of cherry pick ideas that that uh, present our point of view as the not only the right one, but the only one. We wish to still be dispassionate, uh, disinterested and objective when we look at the subject matter and we should present present both sides. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that we are thorough, right? We don't just pick the things that we think are going to make our uh, our side look great and the other side look horrible. There could be other points that the, or there could be points that the other side has uh, that are worth considering. And they're consi worth considering because they may in fact strengthen your argument. So there is a degree of responsibility to the subject. And uh, we need to be truthful with both sides if we're looking at a particular issue that is controversial, not because it's, uh, it's going to get people's, you know, people riled up, but because there are two valid perspectives. And we did this in the ethics course. Um, many of you were really kind of split down the middle in terms of a lot of different subjects, uh, whether we were talking about euthanasia or state sponsored torture, whatever. It was evenly split, but each position was valid. It wasn't like there was one clearly wrong uh, position and one clearly right. There, there's no such thing. Okay. So we're responsible to our audience, to our subject, and also to our ethos, right? So to our character, because remember, I said at the beginning that when we are writing, we are presenting to the other person, the reader, the listener, a version of ourselves. And when we write in a sloppy kind of way, we're kind of presenting a sloppy version of ourselves. And that's not who we are, right? Um, that's why if uh, in other classes, I like to give students lots of time before they have to start thinking about an essay topic, for example, because I want them to have the time to think it through. Uh, if you're like me, I do lots and lots of thinking and I might, you know, 
jot down a few things. I tend to read lots of books, but I'm also doing the thinking kind of uh, to myself and I might mention it to someone else and kind of clarify some ideas. I do a lot of that and then I write. And when I write, I write fairly quickly. But right now we're talking about our character, right? The, the version of ourselves that we present to the other, this, the listener, the reader. And we want to, at the very least, at the very least present competence and you know decency and common sense and goodwill uh the things that make a person trust that reader or that speaker because if you don't um it becomes difficult for you to convey your message to the other person if that other person listening or reading gets suspicious about the way you're doing things now we've talked about uh reading and listening when someone is listening uh and a person is presenting their their case will say whether again a TED talk or something else there's a lot of extra stuff that is going on when we are presenting an idea to another person to the audience and this is the kind of nonverbal communication that let's say to be honest is difficult to uh to control when you're really nervous uh I'm sure you've done group presentations you've done single presentations in classrooms or classroom setting you may have had to speak in front of a, a crowd that is to some people a mortifying thing it just they would rather walk it under traffic <laughs> than to present something to a group of people um, and as a result because we tend to get nervous and a little bit anxious we get fidgety we start uh you know putting the wrong stress on a word we pause uncomfortably or too often uh we might sort of start fidgeting we start slouching uh we are not presenting a degree of confidence the other thing too is a lot of hand movements now i'm really ha lucky right now because the camera is only capturing me from the the shoulders up but if you've seen me in classroom um or hopefully you will maybe by next year i tend to use my hands a lot and it isn't because i'm nervous it's just the way i talk <laughs> and i like to you know gesture and gesticulate and so on um i'm comfortable doing that if some if it unnerves some people i think eventually they realize it that's just what he does right it's it is what it is and it's not that um again it's not that i'm nervous uh sometimes i like to use hand gestures to to emphasize certain things so if you can control them that's a good thing when it's something you cannot control and it is sort of a nervous laughter uh or you know facial expressions that clearly are communicating to the to the again in this case the listener because you're right in front of them uh to the listener um, a degree of confidence or belief in what you're saying <clears throat> that is bordering on the inability to control your own body. That's why people who do TED Talks, and I keep using that as an example because it is the only form of sort of uh, not even public debate, but public presentation, public speakers, right? We used to have lots more public speakers. We have very few of them now. Those people are professionals in every sense of the word. They know every action, every nonverbal uh, action or body language matters right it gives them a sense of authority because they're able to communicate without without drawing attention to those those body movements uh in a significant way they'll certainly use their hands to gesture and make a point but that's exactly it it's there to make a point they're in control of their body movements and the cadence of their voice the way in which they can hesitate intentionally rather than you know uh Un uncontrollably that kind of thing um it makes them a better presenter and it's part of that ethos right that the commitment they have to the audience to the subject and of course to themselves now one way we can get around uh these kinds of issues where we're going to be using language effectively is and i know a lot of people don't do this anymore is just to read 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 lots if you're a text junkie like me you literally are going to read everything i'm going to read the back of a cereal box you know while i'm having breakfast um i look at stuff all the time now whether they're billboards or whether they're actual books just just read a lot if you read a lot you are going to become a better writer it's it's that simple uh it's just that some people have difficulties sort of reading books for me at this point in time i'm not going to be some old curmudgeon you know cave dweller luddite going you gotta be reading books no if you're reading something on social media if it's got some degree of intelligence have at it because you're still reading and i am not going to be you know some kind of superior snob and say you must only read books 
I really don't care what you read, but just read. Read, and as you're doing that, think even just, you know, uh, almost unconsciously how the person is conveying that message to you, because that will say a lot uh, about the person that is writing, uh, the way they communicate, the words they choose, the the passion they have in their in their work and their writing, and really that's how you become a good writer, right? You just read as much as you can. Now, I would prefer if it was books, but I'm not going to argue. If you're reading, you're reading. Period. I don't care if you're reading subtitles in a foreign movie. It doesn't matter. Just read. Okay. The other thing too that's, uh, that can be really helpful is getting feedback from readers. Um, when we, when we open ourselves up to constructive criticism, it makes, uh, our writing much, much better. Uh, right here, I think I've mentioned before, this is, uh, my, uh, reader's report right there for the book I've just finished, right? It's several pages long. I've been writing since 1975, since probably your parents were born. Um, but I had to, you know, take it and, and read it. And guess what? All of it was constructive, right? All of it was useful because overall, this is an interesting and worthwhile project. And I hope this book is published. Okay. All right. Overall, very good. There's some good work here. Here's how you can make it better. And I've, I have two options. I could say, Ah, the hell with you. What do you know? Or I can say, I'm going to read through this carefully and I'm going to respond to as many of the uh, criticisms or suggestions to sometimes they were just that, you know, you might want to do this or that. And guess what? At the end of the day, I'm the one who looks better, not this person, me. So why not, right? Why not follow through and take the feedback from readers? Um, now, this isn't something that happens very often. It may happen for instructors that they may have a, a conference paper they want to present and they may not have anybody they can bounce ideas off of. But when you're in a position like that, yeah, it's it's a lot more difficult. You have to kind of believe in yourself, right? Have that confidence to present it without any feedback at all. And you hope that it's going to work well. Now, uh, the more you write, as well as the more that you read, um, the more likely you are to know whether something's going to work or not. Um, but in this particular case, this because it's being officially published by an actual book publishing company, um, they want things to be the best that they can be. And so uh, if you submit a manuscript, this is one of the things you've got to go through. Uh, it's called a peer review. And a peer review, this is clearly this was written by someone that knows this subject uh, as much as I do, if not more, because their suggestions were very helpful, very critical, but very specific but they were all constructive. So feedback from readers is always a good thing. So uh, if we're thinking about using language effectively, uh, you can apply that to literally everything. It isn't just a case study for a classroom. It isn't just sort of a conversation you may have with someone. Uh, you, can, you can think about those with an email, like the example I gave you earlier, where the email I needed to carefully consider its tone, the language, and most important, the impact that it may have. So there's no reason why you can only, you know, you only have to do this with, uh, let's say, a conference paper. Why not just try to get you, try to use to, you know, get used to doing this all the time? Um, you're probably probably less likely to insult people or offend people if you think through your idea. And I mean, even if it's on the cuff, uh, you don't have to respond and fill up, you know, the the silence with words stop and think just stop and think for a moment and say okay how do i want to say this so what you're doing in your head as much as you can do it on paper is revising right you're going to revise your your statement so that it is presented in the best way possible and this has really kind of been the the mantra for this entire course is the fact that if you're doing this you know if you revise and in my case I've now revised a 300 and something page, you know, document, a manuscript about four times. And of course, even before I submitted it the first time, I revised it numerous times. So I've kind of lost count, but let's say seven or eight times I've revised it to make it better and better and better. So whether it's an email or a 300 plus page, you know, project, uh, doesn't matter, but revision always makes uh, makes things better put it this way too revision um, if you're a musician as well which is what I am when I revise something I often am taking away stuff 
right? I'm often taking away the clutter, the verbiage, the unnecessary things so that my idea or my, my piece of music is as clear and concise as I can make it. When you revise, it's rare that you're adding, right? You're clarifying, but it's rare that you add more stuff to it because you want to give the listener, right? If they're listening to music or your speech or the reader, <clears throat> the best version of this idea that you wish to present to them. Okay. So how would you do that? Uh, the first thing you want to do is you want to define, uh, your, de your decisions and your goals for writing something. Now it may not be that you have the opportunity because you're in, in a classroom setting at a, in a college and you're given assignments. I want you to write the following. I want you to write a response to this. So, even though uh, you are given a, a task, an assignment to follow through with, there's no harm in still defining the decisions and the goals that are going to go into identifying what needs to be revised, uh, what should be omitted, you know, what should be left as is. All these things are going to be there as you work through the material and certain things in the big picture. Um, again, quick example from my book. Um, one of the things that I did take out are references to a time period that really was not relevant to the overall, um, no, the overall subject matter. This group of people that I was studying, uh, wrote and, and did work in the late fifties and throughout the 1960s. And I had some really cool ideas, but from the 1910s and 1920s, thinking that the reader would kind of make the connection and, and my reader, my, my critical reader, um, said, you know, what does this have to do with uh with these people because you know they lived in the 1960s and you're talking about the 1910s you're talking about a period before the, the first world war okay um it should be revised in fact it should be taken right out and sure enough there were three large chunks that i took out uh i only i know where they, they were there when i read through it now uh it's like they were they never existed so sometimes revision is that just taking out something that it just isn't relevant so when I defined my goal, ultimately, no, interesting stuff. I could raise it, you know, if somebody were to ask me, but it's not, it's not relevant. So the relevancy of something is really one of the ways in which you can uh, revise your draft. Do I need to present this? Am I just kind of bragging? Oh, look how much I can study and, you know, find cool, interesting things. But is it relevant? No, it's not. Then unfortunately, it's got to go out. So two, uh, possible choices for uh, improving the draft in terms of its structure, uh, clarifying your thesis statement, presenting evidence to support that statement, arranging material in, a, in either a chronological sequence or in a sequence of importance from most to least, or the opposite, from least to most. Now, why would you want to do that? Because you want to leave the reader with your final, most critical thought at the tail end, right? Where perhaps it really matters because it's the last thing that that person will have read. Three, you want to gather relevant information and evaluate its pros and cons. Now that's partly in reference to what I've just talked about, you know, picking something that was, I thought was interesting from the 1910s when I'm writing about a group of people living in the 1960s. Okay. Interesting, but not relevant. But what I was also doing was collecting a lot of information about other thinkers at exactly the same time. So, as I read through it and I evaluated the pros and cons of making comparisons and contrasts between this group of thinkers versus that group of thinkers, I was able to, to sort of weigh the pros and cons of having these people there. So if you are doing that, you can then uh, turn around and select the ones that best need your or meet your writing needs in terms of evidence and support for the main thesis. Four, uh, once you've done that, you want to uh, evaluate your writing by reading it again, slowly and completely. And this is the stage I'm at now. I'm uh, going to read it through one last time. And here I'm now, I'm going to be looking for grammatical, you know, errors, um, subject verb agreements, these kinds of things. I caught one, which I thought, wow, what a rookie, right? He's only been writing for 400 years, but he can't even get that right. So I've caught a couple of those. Uh, and that's typically when you are editing and when you're editing, uh, editing on a computer, you'll notice that you'll, you'll write a sentence and you'll chop out a little bit of it by just going backwards, you know, using your, your, um, uh, your backspace key, that kind of stuff. Um, be careful, uh, because it'll be there, but you want to still read the entire new statement to make sure that the subject and the, and the 
object match, the subject and the verb match, so that everything is grammatically correct. And like I say, I'm at this point now where I'm beginning to read carefully and slowly through it one last time because all the critical commentary has been addressed. The uh, revisions are now finished. Now I'm going to read it one more time. And this time I'm going to look for just spelling mistakes. And guess what? I found a few already. And that was just by accident. Okay. So what I want to do now is to kind of go through one final set of uh, sort of uh, considerations, we'll call them when you want to revise your essay and or you might have a chance to to help uh you know a, a schoolmate uh, you might read their work and they may be asking you for some feedback so really any written assignment can be done this way uh you could as long as you show it to another person and they read through it though they may spot some things that are unclear and it isn't because they don't have the intelligence to understand it the issue there is or should be with the writer, not the reader. The writer should make something clear so that the reader will be able to understand. So whenever something is presented to, uh, to you in terms of feedback saying, uh, th this isn't clear, don't take it out on them. It's being constructive. You, you can go back and ask them exactly what was it that was unclear. Well, these two statements here, there's, is there something missing here? Like they kind of don't follow and go, okay, Again, don't tear their head off. They're trying to help you. Uh, you read through it and go, okay, uh, I see what you mean. So here are some things that we can do. First of all, you want to think big. Let's go, let's go establishing shot. Let's go macro, right? As large as possible. So look at the draft as a whole, right? Whether it is an email, a five, ten, a five or 10 or 15 page assignment, a book or whatever, a uh, case study, think of it in its totality, right? And ask yourself these questions. Does it fulfill the assignment's purpose in terms of the topic and length? Uh, if you're writing a book, a book can be, you know, 150 pages to 800 pages. Um, does the assignment fulfill the mandate of dealing with the topic in a concise sort of way? Uh, and concise can still be 300 pages, surprisingly. Does it have a clear focus? Is there an overall focus? Is there a sense of movement and direction towards something? Um, what part of the draft uh, may not relate to the main focus? Do uh, does does the does the piece lose its focus at a certain point? Does it kind of meander a little bit too much? I know this is something I'm guilty of because I love to do research and I love to just throw everything into the mix. Uh, the end result is, at the end of the day, I have things that maybe are less relevant. They're interesting, but they're not relevant to the main topic, to the main thesis. Um, look at it and say, well, could I reorganize it differently? Is there a reason why I've structured it in the way that I have? What if I moved my, the, the chronology from most important to least important? What if I tried it the other way around? Would the impact of my paper be different? Likely it will be. Um, can you add extra evidence, right? That will strengthen your thesis. Uh, can you make the flow of paragraphs a little bit smoother? And that's when uh, transition sentences are really, really useful. Imagine that you are the reader of this text and you are questioning not every single statement, but statements, especially towards the tail end of a paragraph. A paragraph at the end should be kind of wrapping up a single thought. How does that single thought refer to the next paragraph? Is there a proper trans transition or is it kind of clunky? If it's a little bit clunky, maybe even just a single statement might be worthwhile at the beginning of the next paragraph to have those two tie together. And if you continually do that, then the flow of paragraphs will be much, much smoother. Do we have a consistent point of view on the subject matter? Uh, do we sort of vacillate back and forth? And it, seem, it seems at one point we're for it and all of a sudden we're against it or we don't know. Um, we need to have a fairly consistent point of view. Now, if you are going to present a, a critical appraisal of something, then you clearly you need to present that thing that you're going to criticize, and then you go about criticizing it. So uh, the point of view is still consistent. You want to provide critical commentary, and you can also you know, yield occasionally and say, uh, I concede this point, this group of people had the right idea, but in hindsight, perhaps it was not the right one. Well, the in hindsight, is a way for you to still keep your consistent point of view. You wish to be critical and you're understanding that at this particular time, you know, in the 1950s or 60s, that may have been something of great concern. 
we have the advantage of hindsight. We have the advantage of looking at something 60 or 70 years ago. And clearly, the concern they had then was unwarranted. Okay, it's still a point of view. It's still consistent. And in, uh, other things, finally, are there alternative ideas that might improve the, the draft? Is it possible to present something that is an alternative, but it's not going to confuse people at the same time? Because you don't want to be doing that. Okay, so that was kind of a macro establishing shot, wide view, you know, the overall kind of stuff. Now we're going to try to focus in a little bit and think in terms of a medium uh, view. And that's the paragraph by paragraph structure. So you look at the introduction. Does the introduction actually present that which is part of the essay? Uh, I recommend to students usually to write the introduction last. I mean, you can write sort of a, a temporary one because some people just like to do that. But remember and consider that you will go back and revise it because you've written an introduction to something that doesn't exist yet. And clearly, if you leave yourself open to new ideas, that introduction may actually reflect a final product that really isn't there. So give your give yourself the time to go back and revisit that introduction. Did I actually set out to do what I wanted to do? If you're writing a book, in my case, uh, the beginning of my conclusion, I say, you know, have we answered the question? We've looked at this and this and this. Uh, and I would like to argue that we have, you know, we presented some people that had a direct impact on these thinkers. And then we also included other people that had thematic similarities that didn't have a direct impact on the people we're looking at, but have an impact on our understanding of what these people were doing. So they coexisted, they were contemporary thinkers, but they didn't influence one another. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that although they didn't, they were thinking along the same lines because it was kind of in the air, right? So these things you can address in the conclusion. But paragraph by par paragraph, you want to think of the introduction and say, okay, does the introduction actually introduce the paragraphs and the ideas, the paragraphs that are, sorry, the ideas in the paragraphs that follow? Okay, so individual par paragraphs, do they individually support the thesis claim? Um, is the evidence there? Are the body paragraphs, should they be combined into sort of one main thought? Because I tend to write in sort of smaller digestible paragraphs. That's only because I've had enough experience with students that the way students read now is I think they prefer to have not a big block of text. In other words, just a wall of text on a page um, because it doesn't take long to kind of lose the, the sense of focus. So I like to break things up so that visually it's a little bit more pleasing to the eye. And when you look at a paragraph, it will have one main idea. So you can sometimes combine them together. Uh, if the body paragraphs are completely irrelevant, eliminate them altogether. But when you are writing, you wish to be able to present a single clear thought in each paragraph. And if you have a new one, start a new paragraph. It's, there's, there's no law against it. That's really what, what's, uh, what's going on. Now, interesting visuals. Of course, visuals will always help, but sometimes you don't have the opportunity. Um, in the case of a published book, well, I would need to get permission from every single person that has created every single image that I used, unless I make them myself. Uh, hopefully, if all goes well, the cover is actually a picture I took back way back in 1980, and I would be absolutely stoked if they could use it. And it sounds like they will. So it's a little kind of personal thing for myself, um, but I took that photograph. And I can actually hand them in the original document. <laughs> Boy, and it's old too, too, because I took it in 1980. So 41 years, uh, 41 years ago, exactly. So get, getting back on track here. So body paragraphs, uh, really should allow the argument to flow sort of through each individual paragraph. And the transitions should not be bumpy, but should be fairly clear. Uh, the conclusion is also important. Uh, is it concluding? that which we have just finished reading? Uh, is there a way that we can strengthen the conclusion in some way? Uh, the overall tone, does it match the tone of the rest of the text? Now, a conclusion could be a paragraph or it could be an entire chapter. In my case, it's a chapter, but I like to write a conclusion no matter what I'm writing because we get to revisit some of the ideas. And also too, with conclusions, you can also present uh, possible you know, new vistas or, and new uh, paths to follow. Uh, nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, there's, and I've read many books that say, it is beyond the scope of this book to look at this, but let's consider the following. So again, the, the, the writer has considered the fact that this 
book needs to be needs to be contained you know needs to be structured in some way and sure this is interesting but just it kind of lies outside the immediate interest that we have um in my case i'm going to take another shot of these people because as i read through this material and i was thinking more and more about it i just finished a course at western uh where some students raised these same issues one student even is doing a presentation or did a presentation and will be submitting a full uh, essay on this same topic that I wish to look at more carefully uh, the second time around. So in my conclusions, those that was one of the things that I, that I came up with. Like, yeah, I'd want to follow this in a bit more detail, although unfortunately it's beyond the, the, you know, the scope of this particular uh, project. Okay, so now, <coughs> excuse me, we're now back down. We've start with kind of the draft as a whole. We've looked at individual paragraphs. Now we're going to look at the content of the paragraphs, which are the sentences. So we're looking at uh, the draft sentence by sentence. This is the kind of the position I'm at now. Uh, are some sentences kind of a little clunky, hard to understand? Can I reword them? Can I clarify them? Can I put them in the present tense if they're in the past tense? Uh, I think I mentioned last week when, when you're writing about a, a thinker, if you're talking about them as a person, clearly you're going to use the past tense. We're not going to talk about Shakespeare still alive, but the books that are the plays that he has written continue to exist. So you can discuss his work in the present tense. But when you discuss Shakespeare as a person, you know, what he had for lunch, where he lived, clearly that was in the, that will have to be in the past tense. This person is, is no longer with us. So that kind of stuff uh, is important because it does give the reader, again, that sense of clarity, that sense of distinction between think you're no longer with us book that continues to exist that we will continue to discuss. Um, you can reword the sentence uh, to reflect that. Some sentences might be too long. Uh, do you use too many semicolons when in fact perhaps the occasional period might work? Some sentences might be really short. Uh, in fact, I think I've one one sentence, a short, or, yeah, the shortest sentence in my book is says, short answer, no. That's literally what I say. People uh, talk that way. Now, is it grammatically correct? It's kind of on the borderline, um, but it's a statement, and there it is. It's it's a short uh, statement, short and sharp to the point. It's not vague, but it it makes sense because of what has just come prior and what we're going to go into. So I thought, no, I'm going to leave it like that. Nobody called me on it. So occasionally, a short sentence can be effective, but you don't want to have a a whole paragraph full of short statements. Many of them can be brought together and joined together with either a comma or a semicolon. So sentences, again, we thinking last week of the Goldilocks effect, you know, just right. So try both and see which one sounds better. Uh, make sure that sentences, of course, are grammatically correct. Um, I've caught a couple of them where the subject and verb agreement is incorrect. And it was likely because I had edited the sentence and I had moved something or removed something and forgot uh, to go back and check it. And then finally, uh, this is the, the nitpicky sort of nitty gritty kind of stuff. Um, the clarity of certain words, right? Are certain words unclear or confusing? Uh, could I use a different word? Now, in a case study or in the work you're doing right now, you may be uh, writing using jargon. Uh, you may be using acronyms. You may be using very specific language to your field. Um, those may not be you know, words that cause confusion if you provide a brief definition. It could be just the nature of the work that allows you to use this kind of vocabulary that each of you understand, but the general interest reader may not. So if you look at certain words and they're, they could be unclear to the reader, then because you have an obligation to your audience, then clarify it. A footnote, an endnote, maybe a single, single sentence in the paragraph for clarification, and you can do it. Um, words can be misspelled. Uh, in my case, I use a lot of French words because these people I was studying came from France and some of the, some of the ideas that they, uh, they can come up with like dérive and détournement. These are words that have a, a an E with an accent aigu, right? Accent grave and circonflex and all that sort of stuff. I need to make sure that all those are correct. So the word may appear correct, but in French, it's not. So I need to make sure that I catch that. Because guess what? Microsoft Word doesn't speak French, so it doesn't even see them. So in fact, sometimes tries to correct them so that suddenly derive becomes derive. No, it's derive. It's a French word. Um, page numbering. Is it proper? Um, is the assignment formatted properly? Is it consistent? 
Is there anything else you can fix in that draft? If there's anything at all that you can fix, I would say, go ahead. And so finally, we're done. School's out. We're finished and it's exactly 45 minutes. That's what I thought it would take. Okay, so this is it for our content for this course uh, in this module 13 using language thoughtfully. And then there will be one last assignment, again, a fairly simple one, uh, talking about jargon and talking about uh, sort of cliches and things that we use that kind of come in and out of focus and in and out of use. Uh, but I'll talk about it in more detail on, on uh, Thursday when we meet. So in the meantime, take care. It's Monday morning and it's just a really crappy day. So be thankful you don't have to actually go to school today. So um, I will see you soon and we'll talk again on Thursday.